pressure stabilized Petrov Galerkin, and we'll find actually that we have to combine this with least squares in compressibility constraint um, in order to stabilize the Stokes equation. Yeah, because the Stokes equation is the one that we'll use as our prototypical equation for figuring out how these stabilization parameters are supposed to behave. And first of all, again, focus on the case of the linear basis functions, because that's uh, the, the easier case. How, how is that going to affect our equations? Well, I've repeated here the stokes weak formulation. That'll be this one, with our least squares on the incompressibility constraint uh, stabilization term, and our pressure stabilized petrov galerkin term. Now remember that that was tau PSPG times an operator on the test function, in this case the gradient of Q, times the residual of the momentum equation, well that's going to be minus uh, nu times uh, the second order operator acting on U, uh, plus the gradient of, of the pressure. Well for linears it is, in this case, this part of the equation uh, that's going to be equal to zero. It's going to be identically equal to zero, uh, so we don't have to consider that. Okay, so after we've made that simplification, the coercivity statement would be the following. So I'm going to take the same functions in both slots. Oh, from the first time I already get a, a normed quantity. I have the square root of nu times the symmetric gradient of u squared. The second and the third term, uh, they're going to combine into minus twice P comma the divergence of V. Sorry, Q. Maybe I should also spend a few words uh, explaining the choice of uh, formulation here. You actually have two choices of formulation for the Stokes equation, uh, a symmetric one or a non-symmetric one. Uh, and that has to do with this uh, equation right here, minus Q times the divergence of U. Um, that's the, the lower part of your system of equation. And in a strong form, you, you can simply multiply this equation by minus 1 and you get the exact same uh, result. Uh, so um, um, we typically do that to get a symmetric system of equations. Uh, you don't have to do this. If you don't do this, then that actually uh, would cancel this term in your coercivity statement, uh, but it would show up in your boundedness statement. And, and, and to be perfectly correct, you have to consider both the coercivity statement and the boundedness statement to make a claim on the performance of your method. Um, so my, my trick here right now is to choose the symmetric case. That's actually the more difficult case to prove coercivity. But if we now can prove coercivity, uh, then, then we are also uh, safe on our boundedness estimate. So yeah, I'm choosing the symmetric version of the Stokes equation. So I have uh, here in both cases a minus rather than a minus and a plus, which means that I'm adding these together to form minus twice, well, that term. Okay, which other terms do I have left? Well, both of my stabilization terms right now are going to be normed terms. I have the norm of the square root of tau PSPG times the gradient of Q squared plus the norm of the square root of tau LSIC times the divergence of V squared. Yeah, so actually I have a whole bunch of, of square norm terms and it's, it's only this, this, uh, this mixed term between the, the, the pressure variable uh, Q and the velocity variable V uh, that seems to be spoiling the result. And again, this is a funny non-symmetric term. So how would I go, how would I go about replacing this term by somehow a bound uh, on, on, on normed quantities. Well, we had a trick for that. That was the Young's inequality. Yeah? So I can again make use of the Young's inequality to treat this term. Now let me replace the Young's inequality. I think it's useful to have seen this a couple of times. Young's inequality said that if I have the inner product of two functions, then that's going to be, an, again, the negative, and then that's going to be bound from below by the negative of minus 1 over 2 times epsilon times the norm of the first function minus epsilon over 2 and times the norm of the second function. If I'm not mistaken, I actually proved this uh, inequality in the lectures on, on the first lecture on coercivity. Yeah, so if you're interested, uh, have a look at, at those videos. So in this case, I have a function 2 up front here. 
So I would get actually minus 2, which would get rid of the half here. And again, this inequality uh, has a free parameter epsilon. And in fact, it's going to be true for any choice of epsilon as long as epsilon is larger than 0. Okay, so let me uh, use Young's inequality to treat the term that I've boxed in red. So that gives me minus 2 times q divergence of v is going to be larger than or equal to minus 1 over epsilon times the norm of q square minus epsilon times the norm of the divergence of v square. Okay, so this is starting to get somewhere. I have now a norm on my divergence. Well, I had a norm on a divergence here as well. And right here, I, I have a, a Q, a norm on Q, and I had some sort of norm on Q here as well. Now, again, this is a difference between the norm on Q or the norm of Q on the gradient. So in order to treat this, I either need this inverse inequality that we also saw in the last video, but actually the way that these are formed uh, I actually am fine using the Poincaré inequality. This is going to be larger than or equal to um, minus the Poincaré constant square epsilon times the norm of the gradient of Q. Yeah, so let me also repeat uh, the Poincaré inequality. Poincaré is an inequality set that we, we can take the L2 integral of a function, let's call it Q, and that's going to be bound from above uh, by the Poincaré constant of the norm of that function, uh, derivative of this function. Yeah, so I can square this, then we have a square, a square, a square, and I have a minus up front here as well, so we get a minus and a minus, and, but that means that we get a flip of the inequality sign, and that is precisely what we have done right here. Oop. Now whatever, this guy. Okay, so now I've can, uh, I can replace this term in my coercivity estimate by these guys. So let me repeat the whole coercivity estimate at this point. We have the bilinear form, substitute the same functions in both slots, v and q, v and q. And that's going to be larger than or equal to our norm on the diffusive part. our norm on the PSPG part of the gradient of Q, our norm on the LSIC part, on the divergence of V, but now minus CP squared divided by epsilon times the gradient of Q, and minus epsilon times the divergence of v. Yeah, so naturally the trick is going to be to link these two together and to link these two together. Now my epsilon is going to be a constant and the Poincaré uh, inequality is also going to be a constant so I can actually move both of these into the inequalities. So that's going to, let me just write that in the same line here. So that, that's going to make this a norm. And that means that we have to take a square root here. So we get this. And the same thing here. So we get this guy and a square root. Okay. Yeah, so now I can combine them a little easier with the terms that we had. So what happens if... I choose, well, let's, let's think about how, the way that I want to do this. Okay, the easiest way is, is naturally I'm going to choose epsilon to be equal to tau LSIC divided by 4. If I do that, 
And I combine that with these two. Well, what do I get? Well, I'm left with half of my norm of the square root of tau LSIC times the divergence of the Right, so I'm still left with half of a normed quantity on the divergence of my velocity field. Okay, good. Well, now I've made a choice for epsilon, so that's going to be the same choice that I have to make uh, to treat uh, this, this gradient of Q term. So now what do I have? I have the norm of the square root of tau PSPG minus CP divided by well, actually, yeah, okay, okay, let's write it like this. Uh, the square root of well, tau LSIC divided by four, the normal four, or the square root of four, so that, that gives me a two up here. And both of these are multiplied by the gradient of Q. Yeah, so this gives me a relationship between the two parameters, the tau for the, the pressure stabilized Petrov Kalurkin and the tau for the and least squares an incompressibility constraint. And that is precisely why I was treating these at the same time. You need both of these in order to, uh, to stabilize the Stokes equation. And now we also understand why. It's because we have to, to separate this term into its two components, one of which can be, can be treated with uh, the petrov galerkin on the pressure st stabilized petrov galerkin uh, and one with uh, the LSIC, the least squares an incompressibility constraint. Yeah, so uh, the relation that I'll have to choose between the tau PSPG and LSIC is such that, and typically we choose tau LSIC in terms of tau PSPG. And so then, if I'm not mistaken, I get, let me just write it out. I get a tau LSIC is going to be equal to... I'm going to write what I have in my notes, but I'm not entirely sure if that's actually correct. I have here 4 cp squared divided by tau PSPG. But I feel like it should be, it should be larger than that. Um, Okay, yeah, probably the, the point is here. I probably can, I can, sorry, this can just be two and then it will be half here, sorry. So then we also have this and then I think I can make this choice yeah um, okay let me just substitute this and see what happens oh Okay, uh, yeah, I'll substitute that and then I obtain the norm of the square root of tau PSPG. And the square roots are a little annoying, right? Mm. The annoying thing also is that it's not really a square root because, well, there's a square here as well. How do I do this most cleanly? Hey, you know what? I'll, I'm gonna write it. I'm gonna write it slightly differently. Sorry, control Z. Uh, I'm gonna pull out these guys simply in front of the norms. Yeah, so I'm gonna assume at this point that we have constant uh, stabilization parameters. Uh, typically, you don't have constant stabilization parameters. Um, but it will just clean up the stability proof. Uh, you don't have to make this assumption, but you will get very ugly expressions. Uh, you can always prove it also without this, this, this assumption, um, but then it's not going to be as clean. Okay, so we get these guys up front, right? So then we have 
tau PSPG times the norm of the gradient of Q squared minus uh, CP squared divided by epsilon times the gradient of Q squared uh, or tau PSPG uh, minus CP squared and now we substitute this assumption on uh, epsilon gives me divided by tau LSIC and we have a 2 up here as well yeah okay so now I'm making my um, my choice on tau LSIC and then I sorry times the norm of gradient Q square so what you're left with is half and this should ju just be half tau P S P G times the gradient of Q squared yeah okay so let's combine everything in one last uh, statement B V comma Q V comma Q that's going to be bound from above by norm of our original diffusion term plus our half tau PSPG on the gradient of Q plus half tau LSIC on the divergence of V. Yeah, so this is again a normed quantity. We have proven that uh, coercivity holds and we have found a relation that we require between our two uh, parameters. Now again, this is just a relation and we're still extremely free in our choices of tau LSIC uh, and or, or our choice of tau PSPG. Uh, so now we'll find uh, in the next video that we get certain constraints on these choices if we consider uh, higher order basis functions. Yeah, so we'll see that in the next video.